doing this morning? Y'all blessed this morning? Yes. Amen. Um, today, the name of the service is The Lord Cannot Fix What Ain't Broke. Did y'all get that? The Lord Cannot Fix What Ain't Broke. Um, last week we spoke on Jesus where his ministry was coming to an end. He, as far as him walking on the earth, and um, we talked about him getting to Jerusalem and addressing some issues that are going on in the temple. The people uh, using the temple for profit. And we established that that happens today. That people use the church for profit. Now, I'm not talking to anybody in specific. I'm talking to everybody who does it for profit. Amen. The word that Jesus was addressing was because they were using the temple uh, specifically and their hearts were based on how much money they can make uh, off of the, 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 the things that they did regarding the temple. And Jesus uses some terms referencing the issues of the nation of Israel from years ago up until that moment. And so he's referring to the nation of Israel, period. And he's, uh, today we'll read from Matthew in chapter 21, uh, Matthew chapter 21, and we'll be going uh, starting at 23. But he gets to the temple and addresses these issues. And he uses some terms that reference the nation of Israel. And that nation is the nation that God chose to introduce his laws through. So that makes that nation special. Not because of anything the nation did, but because God chose that nation. If he chose any other nation, that nation, because God chose them, becomes special. And so he chose the nation of Israel also for the Redeemer to come through. He chose the nation of Israel for the laws to come through and then for, for the Redeemer to come through, um, the Redeemer of the penalty of the violators of the law. And so for those who violated the law, which is everybody, whether you knew it or not, the Redeemer came through the nation of Israel. Now, Jesus established that the temple was supposed to be a house of prayer. How many people know that? The temple was supposed to be a house of prayer but it became, in that, in that moment, it became a den of robbers. It, doesn't that kind of apply to what we see today? Um, the, the church is supposed to be a place where you come to praise God like we just did, to worship God, like, to pray, to be safe, to know that the spirit is there. When it, comes because, uh, when, it, when, when it becomes a part of all the glory of the people instead of the glory of God, that's what Jesus had a problem with. And that's what we have a problem with. When you glorify a man or a woman, when you glorify a praise team, when you glorify whatever, the building, or it's so immaculate, I've got to go there. Well, you're not going there for the spirit. You're going there for the building. So why does he do that? Because the church is supposed to be about God. It's not supposed to be about anything else. The temple was supposed to be about the Lord. It wasn't supposed to be about anything else. It was supposed to be a place of praise, a place of worship, a place of healing. But it became money motivated back in those days. And he continued um, through what we read last week by cursing the fig tree. Now it brings new light to the fig tree. Because he didn't curse the fig tree just because he wanted to show them that the fig tree would wither up. He cursed the fig tree to show that the nation of Israel was not producing. They were not productive. They were not doing the things they were supposed to do in the kingdom. So he continued because of their non-production in the nation of Israel. And so he directly addressed the actions of these men of God at that time. The chief priests, the elders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Anyone who led other people astray, he addressed those actions. 
Why? Because it wasn't about the Pharisees. It wasn't about the Sadducees. It wasn't about the chief priests. It was about the people they affected. Jesus was worried about the people they affected. He wasn't worried about them knowing him. So he directly addressed them. And he, he called them all kinds of things, like false teachers and he called them all kinds of things because of the ways they treated not just uh, each other, but the ways they treated themselves, the ways they treated the other people outside of the people who believed. And so what we establish here, and I, I want you to know this, that what we establish here is when you're reading scripture, um, when you're reading the teachings of our Lord, and Jesus is making a point it doesn't just stay in that parable you're reading. It goes further, and sometimes it goes before. That's why it's unsafe just to say, I'm going to read a parable a day if you didn't understand what you read yesterday, how it relates to what you read today, and how it will relate to what you read tomorrow. That's why I'm, I'm doing it like this, so that you'll understand that the fig tree and everything else, Jesus addressing them in the temple, all relates to the same problem, the nation of Israel. And what we read today about Jesus' authority being questioned, oh, Jesus has jokes. <laughs> Jesus makes me laugh sometimes when I'm reading this word because I know that he was thinking about me when he said some of these things because he knows how I think. And so uh, we want to read this today. Well, we we want to establish that, first of all, that when, when you're reading, make sure you read before and read after because it will help you to understand that the scripture is, is not just based on what you need for that day, but if you understand what Jesus meant in that moment before and after, then you get the, the word of God solely into you. And you start to understand the scripture completely. So it's important to read before and after when you're studying in order to have the completion of your studying. Now, I want you to note this. Jesus, like we said last week, he had just cleared that temple. He had just cleared it of the, the money exchangers and people and anyone who was involved in that, that exchanging of the money where they were selling sacrifices and, and, and just exchanging money back and forth and the temple was making a profit. And so he had just cleared that. And that's why you have to know that because if you just read this next, uh, this next part that we're going to read, 23 through 27, and you don't understand that he just cleared the temple, then you won't understand what they're talking about when they say these things to him. So Matthew 21, 23, Jesus again goes back to the temple. And he, he goes back to the temple because he's not finished with what he's doing at that temple. He's not finished with, with talking to people about, uh, about salvation. And he's not finished dealing with the, the Pharisees. He's not finished dealing with the chief priests. He's not finished dealing with the elders. So they, they ask him a specific question when he's there teaching. He's there minding his own business, but he's teaching people. And they ask him a question. And so verse 23 is what we are, where we at. The question they ask him is, by what authority are you doing these things? Now, if you did not read before, then you would not understand what he's talking about here. When he says, by what authority, when they ask, by what authority are you doing these things? They're talking about the clearing of the temple, of, which was affecting their prophets. They're asking, how can you come into here and do that? By what authority do you have to turn over tables? By what authority do you have to, 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 to knock the money everywhere? By what authority do you have to keep people out of our temple? That's what he's talking about here. And so it's important that you not just read this, but you read it in Luke and you also read it in, in Mark so that you'll understand it completely and know what he's talking about here. And so they ask, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? <laughs> now Jesus replies. Now, um, I want to give you some history on this. They, they, they're, ask, uh, they're asking on why he did these things um, because they're doing it, I mean, he's doing it against the laws that they have established. Not just the laws of God, but the laws they have established. If you know anything about the Mosaic laws, you know that there were the Mosaic laws that were of Moses, and there were the Mosaic laws that were created by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the chief priests. They created their own system that had nothing to do with God's system, but they added it to it. And so this 
is what's happening here. And so they're, they're, they're attacking him. They're trying to figure out why, how does he have authority. And this is the same thing that was asked of John the Baptist. And I want you to write this scripture down, John 119. John 119 through 21, they asked him the same thing. They asked John, are you a prophet? Are you Elijah? Are you the Christ? They were asking him all kinds of questions. Why? Because they wanted to know what authority does he have to be out there baptizing people and telling people about the word of God. Who, who was this man? And so Jesus, once they asked him that, he asked them a question referring to what we're talking about with John the Baptist. This is what he asked him. I want to read, I want to read verse 24 and 25. Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, now I want you to write that down. Write this down. When he says things like this, if you answer me, or uh, let he who cast the first stone, or let he without sin who cast, cast the first stone, when he say things like that, he knows that the response is not going to be what he's asking for. So he said, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, which means they won't, I will tell you what authority I'm doing these things. He goes back to John's baptism. He said, John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? <laughs> with, with them, it's now, you know, with the, with the Pharisees and the, the chief priests and the Sadducees and all of them, it's never about the truth. It's never about um, answering the question that Jesus is asking them. Truly, it's always about trying to get one over on Jesus, trying to be at the, at the next level, trying to answer the question correctly to where he can't corner them. But how many people know that you cannot stop God from cornering you if he wants to corner you? Amen. So it's never about the truth. It's always about popularity. It's always about pleasing others. Uh, it's always about doing their own separate work. And they're always, and so let, let me show you what they're thinking about. So they decide to go with the safe way. Uh, watch this. Let me read this to you. It says, they discussed it amongst themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't, don't, didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people for they all will hold that John was a prophet. <laughs> so, so you see that? You see how they go in two different, different ways? Yeah. They're, they're wavering. They're not just saying, you know, if, if you're a true Pharisee, if you're a true chief priest, and you believe in God, then you're going to say, John was a prophet. John was this, not, well, if we say this, he may say that. If we say this, he may say that. That's, that's wavering. That's yeah. contradicting. It's totally contradicting. That's right. And so watch this. Watch this. You're exactly right. So watch this. So they answered Jesus. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. They answered Jesus. We don't know. Watch this. Watch this. So they decide to go with the safe way by saying, we don't know. And Jesus basically says, neither do I. Yeah. If you don't know, I don't know. If you ask me a question and want to answer, and I ask you a question and want to answer, and you can't answer my question, then I'm not going to answer your question either. So this is what he said. I'm just, hyped. I'm just adding to this. Then Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Everybody say amen. Amen. He's basically saying, I've asked you a simple question. That question will tear you up inside and get you on the right path if you answer it correctly. If you don't answer it correctly, if you try to overthink who God is and who John was and who Jesus is, and you try to ignore it, then I'll ignore you also. So basically, they're asking them a question. They're trying to figure it out. They're trying to overkill on who, who, what Jesus was asking them. And, and they said, we'll just answer safe. We don't know. And Jesus said, neither do I. Can you imagine them doing that? They're kicking dust up and saying, neither do I. Why? Because it does not matter to him what they do. Because the, he came down not for them. He came down for the lost. Those people were lost and did not want to be found. So Jesus says, neither do I. 
And in reading this, you understand how Jesus' first and second visit to the temple relates. How cursing the fig tree relates to his visits. He continued to bring up the fact that the preaching to them falls on deaf ears. Why should he even bother to tell them anything? Why should he even bother to go any further with it? Because he knows they're not listening. You know, he says further in the book of John, he says, y'all don't hear me because y'all not of me. Y'all are not of my sheep pen. I don't even waste my time talking to you. Why? Because you don't hear me. He says, my sheep will hear my voice. You're not of my sheep, Ben. That's why you don't hear what I'm saying. It's a waste of time for me to talk to you about who I am because you don't even acknowledge me. So anytime he spoke to them about who he was, it was never about the Pharisees. It was always about us. Say amen. Amen. I want you to write this down. Well, first of all, let me read this to you. He brought up the fact that these things fell on deaf ears uh, with, and because it was a waste of time. Uh, because in the Pharisees' eyes, in the chief priest's eyes, in the Sadducees' eyes, in the elders' eyes, they didn't feel anything was wrong. They didn't feel anything they were doing was wrong. So, so I want you to write this down because it's going to help you. In order for the Lord to fix our problem, we have to acknowledge we have them. See, the problems we have as Christians is because we don't acknowledge we have the problems. And because we don't acknowledge the problem, we can't fix what ain't broke. Exactly. So, think about it. In order for the Lord to fix our problems, we have to acknowledge we have them. Isn't that the standard that like AAA, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, or AA, you know, isn't that the standard that they have or where they get that from? Uh, I want to help you with this because the AA, the first thing they say, you, uh, you can come in as an alcoholic, you can come in drinking, you can come in drunk and everything else. But the first thing, the first thing to the road of recovery is you must first admit that you are an alcoholic. You know where they got that from? It's biblical. You just read it. That's right. Jesus is saying, I can't help you because you don't even acknowledge that there's something wrong. So if you don't acknowledge that there's something wrong, how can I help you to make something right? Mm -hmm. So Jesus gives them another parable about two sons who were supposed to work in the vineyard. I want to read verse 28. We want to start at 28 through 31. Uh, 28 through 31. This is what happened. What do you think? Now, here's the funny thing. You know Jesus, right? Y'all are starting to get the mind of Jesus. Jesus jokes around with them a lot. Why? Because he's not worried about whether they get it. He's worried about the, the other people who get it. He's worried about us 2,000 years later reading this and understanding this. Not the Pharisees. Not the people who weren't accepting him. So here's what he says. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? And they said, this is their answer, the first they answered. Now, I want you to understand here, understand something here. When they said the first they answered, they had no clue what Jesus was talking about. Because the second son he was referring to references, I mean, refers to the leaders and their broken ways because they never felt their actions were wrong. And so they never wanted to do the work. They said they were going to do it, but never did it. And so the, the second one, the second one refers to these leaders. So he's basically in front of the leaders, talking about the leaders, and giving them a parable, and they're trying to figure it out, and they're trying to answer it, and he's talking right back at them. <laughs> he's saying, uh, which one do y'all think is wrong? 
And as dumb as they are, they say, oh, well, the first guy was the one who wanted to, wanted to help. Or the first guy is the one who followed the Father's direction. And then Jesus was like, hey, Mr. Cluelesses, let me help y'all with something. This is what he says after that. Now, see, I, I want you to get this. There, 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 you know, the, the reason that the, the, the leaders uh, did not understand that they were broken, didn't understand that their actions were, 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 un, or were not fixable is because they were too self-righteous. I want you to write that down. They were too self-righteous to grasp that the two sons represent the two types of people. I want you to write this down. The two sons represented the two types of people that were in the nation of Israel. Once again, he's still talking about the nation of Israel. He's still talking about these leaders. He's still talking about the leaders of the past. He's talking about Israel with whom the, the Savior came through. The first one, the first one represents the sinners. That's who the first son represents, the sinners who said they will not follow God and then repented of their sins when they heard the truth. They said they would not follow God, but repented of their sins when they heard the truth. And then there's the self-righteous who never had a reason to believe and repent because they thought that their works were enough. They thought that everything they did was righteous. So because they were so self-righteous, Jesus couldn't help them. Why? Because they never got it. They never knew anything was broken. They felt that they were sin free through their sacrifices and through their works. I want you to write this down. Again, the Lord cannot fix what ain't broke. The Lord cannot fix what ain't broke. Meaning if you never acknowledge you have a problem, he'll never have the solution for you. So when the truth is preached, when the Savior arrives, they are so consumed with religion that their brokenness is never fixed. Why? Because their eyes, in their eyes, ain't nothing broke. There's no problems. Look, it doesn't just apply to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or it applies to anybody who, who never acknowledges that they have a problem. It was plain in day, but they were as plain as day, but they rejected him. It was simple, but they, they made it complex. He did miracles, but they didn't acknowledge him. He walked on water. They didn't acknowledge him. He healed people. They didn't acknowledge him. And so it doesn't matter if he brought somebody back from the dead, uh, from dead, Lazarus. It doesn't matter if they were around and they smelt the, the decay and they smelt all that, but he brought them back to life. It doesn't matter about any of that because they still denied him. Why? Because they didn't feel anything they were doing was wrong. And because of that, they could not see the miraculous works of Jesus. It's amazing because some of us say, man, if I seen him walk on water, I'd be like, woo, what? I'm, I'm saved. I, I accept him. But that's not what happened. Because if you had those, the, those phylacteries on, if you had all those tassels and everything else they wore, if you had the, the stuff on and you had been in religion for so long, it's difficult to believe in relationship versus religion because you thought that your religion was relationship, but then you were wondering why you had all these issues. You were wondering why your faith was, was going in different directions. You were wondering why you went to church for 30 years but never knew a relationship with God. The Lord cannot fix what ain't broke. So Jesus addresses this directly in establishing that his and John's words are the same. Let's read verse 31 and 32. He said, which of the two did what the Father wanted? They answered the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes Everybody raise their hand. Say, that's me. I'm one of them. I'm one of them bad people who've done wrong. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe in him. You see that? He's going back to John. He's saying, look, if you didn't believe John, you're not going to believe me. 
Uh, before, if I never came and John was there, you were supposed to believe John. If you didn't believe John, how are you going to believe me? It doesn't matter. What does he say? You know, if, if, if I bring somebody back to life, it doesn't matter. If I raise the dead, if I, if I walk on water, if I do all, if I bring down lightning from heaven, if I bring the Father down, you still would not believe. Why? Because your heart is not right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many miracles Jesus does. He can restore whatever. But they were not going to listen. He says, for John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. So even after Jesus giving yet another parable, they failed to see right, and they only seen themselves as not wrong. I want you to understand that. Even after Jesus giving yet another parable, they failed to see right, and they only seen themselves as not wrong. They could, if, you, if, if they continue to see themselves as not wrong, they'll never see right. There's no way to see right unless you first acknowledge, like we talked about AA, you acknowledge you're wrong, and then you can see right. But you'll never see right before you see that you're wrong. Write this down. People who see themselves as not wrong, you get that? Will never see themselves as not right. You get that? It's so simple, isn't it? The scripture is simple. People who see themselves as not wrong, who, who, who see themselves as not, or who will never see themselves as not wrong, will never see themselves as not right. They'll always think they're right. They'll never think they're wrong. Why? Because they never acknowledge that they were wrong. So if they never acknowledge that they're wrong, they'll never be, they'll never acknowledge themselves as not being right. Oh, we're trying to help you this morning. I hope you get this. So the just of this is, they, is after Jesus clearly showed them their wrongs and the fact that they needed to repent, they, un, they, 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 they finally understood it because this is what they said. They said, uh, two, they said uh, uh, the first is wrong. And then they, they, they looked at Jesus and this is what they said in, the, in verse 45. I want to read this to you. It says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees seized, uh, heard, uh, heard Jesus, Parables, they knew he was talking about them. Uh oh, they got it. Hooray! They finally got it. It took them a while. It took them to another parable. I'm not going to go over that one. But it took them another parable and then they finally got it. It's, oh, dang, wait, wait. Wait a minute. You're not talking about two sons. You're talking about me. You're not talking about this. You're talking about me. Oh, you're talking about all of us. Wait a minute here. I, hey. Why are you talking about us like that? And so Jesus, they finally got it, hooray. Yet they still looked for a way to arrest Jesus. Let's keep reading. Verse 46. They looked for a way to arrest him. See how simple that is? They still looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd. Look, there we go. Afraid of the crowd. Fear. They walked in fear. They walked in what glorifies themselves. We don't want to turn these people in the wrong direction. Why? Because these people have the majority of votes. These people are, are the majority. They looked away at a way to arrest him, but because they were afraid of the crowd, because the people held that he was a prophet. So they didn't care that they held that he was a prophet. They just cared that they didn't want them to turn against him. And so they didn't want to turn any people wrong and make any people mad. Instead of listening to Jesus trying to give them the word of God, they listened to their thoughts and saying, oh man, it's all about us right now. It's all about how I look. It's all about how I feel. It's all about what's going on. It's all about how people look at me. I don't want people to look at me wrong. Yet they still wanted to arrest him. <laughs> and the funny thing was, it wasn't because he was wrong. They wanted to arrest him, and it had absolutely nothing to do with his words being wrong. Because his words were totally incorrect. And they didn't see, and so I want you to write that, this down. They wanted to arrest Jesus because they didn't see themselves as not right. 
Here we go again. You see that? It's simple. Because they didn't see themselves as not right, they seen themselves as right. And because they seen themselves as right, they didn't listen to Jesus when he told them about the sons. They didn't listen to Jesus when he turned over the tables and kicked people out. Their main focus was, how did you affect our profit? Because when Jesus kicked those people out, the money changers, the profit that went to the temple went out with them. And so they didn't understand that. They were like, how are you going to take away from our profit instead of how are you having the authority as Lord? So there's two ways to apply this to our lives because we have to apply it to our church lives first. And there's the, so you have to apply it to your church life and then you have to apply it to your personal lives. And so I want to help you with both of those. How do we apply this to our church lives? Uh, the first way is we realize that the system is broken. I'm not talking about the, I'm talking about the church system. It's broken. Snaps. Broken. All up. I'm talking to the camera. Broken. The system all over the world is broken. And if we realize that it is broken and accept nothing but the direct teaching from the Bible, we'll go in the right direction. That's the start. No smoke strings. I don't need to know how much money you make. I don't need to know about your finances. I'm trying to help you because some churches ask for that. No glamorization. I don't need to know how your ministry is. I don't need to know anything about your church. I just need to hear you teach the word of God. That's all I want to know. Amen. There's no glamorization. There's no smoke screens. It's just what Jesus and his disciples have to say about following his ways. That's all I want to know about it. When I go to a church, that's all I want to know about. I don't want to know about all this. I'm not interested in, in, in glorifying myself. I'm not interested in glorifying their pastor. I'm not interested in anything else. I'm interested in glorifying God. And if what they're doing is not glorifying God, I'm not with you. Why? Because I love God more than I love you. And so we change, we, we apply this to our church lives by first realizing it's broken. And in, if you realize it's broken, then you can fix it. Why? Because God can fix it through you. Now, how do we apply this to our personal lives? Oh, buddy. Everybody say, help me. Help me. How do we apply this to our personal lives today? We realize that we do not know it all. Oh, that helped, that helped some of y'all in here because some of y'all thought y'all knew everything. Some of us thought we knew everything. I know I thought it at one time in my life. I thought, man, you can't tell me. And then I realized, the closer I got to God, I realized how ignorant I've been all my life. Yes. I really realized that I just did not understand. I realized that this word, I've had the Bible, but I didn't apply the Bible. I've read the parables, but I didn't understand the parables. I decided I'm going to read one a day instead of understanding what happened before and what happens after. And so now, um, uh, because I realized that I was broken, God was able to fix me. So we have to realize first, I want you to write this down, that you do not know it all. As a matter of fact, if you detox yourself from religion, you'll learn to get into relationships. You have to detox yourself from all the history that you've had. Some of you have had 30 years in, in church. Some of you have had I don't know how many years in, in whatever uh, part of ministry you've been in. But you have to detox yourself in order to find God. You have to detox yourselves from religion. Did you see, hear that? Detox yourselves from religion and intoxicate yourselves in relationships. Amen. Oh, that's deep. You have to detox yourself from religion and intoxicate yourself in relationship with Jesus. That's it. Don't wait for the brokenness feeling because that's what people look for. They look for that feeling. I need to be, I need to feel broke. I, I, the, the, I know everybody else crying, everybody else going through stuff, but I need to feel it. In order for me to feel it, I, then I'll acknowledge that I'm broke. That's the same thing the Pharisees did. They did not acknowledge Christ when he was in front of them, but they were supposedly preaching about him for years. Don't wait for the feeling because Satan will make sure you never get it. Did you get that? Don't ever wait for the feeling of brokenness because Satan will make sure you, you never achieve that. And as long as you never achieve it, you'll never know it's broken. You have to just trust me on this. 
It's broken. We're broken. And if you walk in brokenness, it'll help you. All right. Next thing, assume you know nothing. Write that down. Assume you know nothing. That's the first, that's the beginning to the Lord being able to fix you. Assume you know nothing. If you assume you know nothing, then you'll understand that you're going in the right direction. Because if you think you know something, just like the Pharisees, he cannot fix what ain't broke. Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they like people like you. You know why? He, he likes people who says, Lord, I can't. But know that he can. How many of you have said that before? Mm -hmm. I can't do it, but you can do all things. Mm -hmm. yeah. He likes people who say, Lord, I, I won't. But I know that you will. I, I know that I won't be able to heal the, the anger and the bitterness in that person. But I know that you will. Lord, please, you take over. You do your work. Don't, do, don't allow me to do it. He wants you to be a person who says, Lord, I don't. But I know that you do. I don't have the ability to forgive on my own. But with Christ, I can forgive because I know that you've forgiven me. That's what he wants you to say. Lord, I feel alone. Has anybody ever said that before? Yeah. Tell the truth instead of going into depression and being by yourself. And, and you got to tell the truth and say, Lord, I feel alone. And then... You can look at him and say, but I know you haven't left me yet because your word says you'll never leave me nor forsake me. That means that you're here with me. So I praise you even in my loneliness. I praise you even in my bitterness. I praise you in my depression. I praise you in every state that I'm in because I give you glory. And I know that your word stands over my loneliness. Amen. Lord, I'm overwhelmed. Has anybody ever said that before? The word says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Paul said that when he was in prison. Paul said that when he was in chains. Paul said that when he was on house arrest. Paul said that when he was going through trials, when he was going through tribulation and everything. He said, I don't care if I die in here. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And you've got to say the same thing. No matter what overwhelming feeling you have, you've got to know that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. I want you to say this one out loud. I want you to say, Lord, Lord I am broken. I'm broken. Please fix me. Please fix me. That is the first, the first, and the only thing you should be doing every day to God. God, I don't know it all. I don't understand it. God, I'm not, I don't know if I'm walking in direction. I, I'm broken. I feel alone. I feel lost. There are things. Without you, I can't do these things. And once you establish that, that's when he's able to fix you. When you acknowledge, I don't know how to work in my relationship, he'll help you to work in it. Instead of thinking, because I have a doctorate degree, because I can do this, because I can talk to people about their relationship, I can work my own out. Then you have to learn how to say, God, I don't know it all. You minister to me. You're the one who talks to other people through me so you can help me in my relationship. Amen. God, I've helped people through their finances. I've helped people you know, make millions. But then in your own life, you're destroyed. Why? Because you have not learned that the works that were done were of God, not of you. He does everything in your life. And so as Christians, in order for us to be fixed, we have to acknowledge that we are broken. In order for us to fix the church, we have to acknowledge that it's broken. In order for our lives to become straight, we have to acknowledge that nothing can be done without God. You can't get up in the morning without God. How many people have got up and not felt it? Do you know that I've experienced that also? But you know what gets me up? The glory of God. If I let myself get me up, I'll get up in pain. I'll get up sick. I'll get up with ailments. I'll get up destroyed. I'll get up feeling the weight of the world. But when I know that God is with me, I get up because of him, not because of me. When you acknowledge that you are broken, then God can fix you. 
When you're trying to figure out answers, know that you're broken in it. Know that you don't understand it. Know that you can only understand it through God. You don't even want to understand it through the world's way. You want to understand it through God because only he can give you strength. Only he can get you through stuff. There are, you know, Paul, when going through his worst situation, meaning he was learning about God, he, was, he had revelation from God. This is 2 Corinthians. He had revelation from God, and then God gave him a thorn in his flesh. That thorn was a messenger of Satan. It tormented him day and night over and over again thought after thought imperfection after imperfection and probably some type of sin he didn't let go of, or some type of problem that he had in his life or some type of a temptation or addiction or whatever it is it never says what it was but it says three times he asked for help and Jesus said my grace is sufficient my power is made perfect in your weakness Family, I'm telling you, you have to acknowledge your weakness daily. You have to acknowledge you can't do it daily. You have to acknowledge without God there's nothing possible. You have to acknowledge you can't breathe without him so that when your breath is taken away, you know that it's coming back. Why? Because the God you serve is greater than the enemy of this world. And we end by saying, the Lord cannot fix when they ain't broke. He couldn't fix the Pharisees because they didn't realize what, what they had was broken. He only fixed people who came freely. Those were Gentiles. Those were people who were half-breeds. There were all kind of people who came to God and said, I wasn't going to serve the Lord, but now I will. I'll repent of my sins. I'll just give glory to God. Why? Because I don't know much about it, but I know that I'm wrong. That's all they did. They acknowledged that they were wrong. And Jesus said he could not fix them because they never acknowledged it. If you, if, if you understand that you are a misfit, that God chose you, that you, are, you walked in unrighteousness, you had no glory in you, you had no favor over your life, you didn't do anything right, but Jesus chose you. I need you to stand and give God glory in the house of the Lord. No.